and hello from the campus of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to Virtual SEI. Our presentation today is five ways to boost cybersecurity with DevOps. We thank you for uh, participating in today's presentation. We will take as many questions as we can throughout the talk. So you can feel free to type them into our chat tab or the Q&A tab, uh, depending on whatever platform you're watching this on. And I, as I stated, we will take as many questions as we can during the talk and as, as many at the end. Uh, now I'd like to introduce, um, should introduce myself first. My name is Shane McGrath. I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. And now I'm going to introduce our two panelists for today's talk. First is Doug Reynolds. Doug is a software engineer within our CERT division. Doug focuses on creating and improving DevOps and software solutions for government entities. Next, we have Aaron Volkman, and Aaron is a software engineer and DevOps researcher within our CERT division, where he specializes in product development research. Aaron advises and assists Department of Defense acquisition programs in their adoption of DevOps principles and automation technologies. Before I turn it over to Aaron, I'll just remind everybody we'd like you to fill out our survey upon exiting today's presentation as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. And you'll see that link to the survey in the chat tab now. So Aaron, welcome, all yours. Oh, thanks, Shane. So we can't, let's just uh, roll right into it. Our number one way to boost uh, cybersecurity with DevOps is collaboration. Uh, Often at times, whenever uh, people talk about DevOps, number one quality attribute of DevOps is collaboration. It's the people aspect of it. A lot of organizations though, because um, it's something that can be seen on an issue tracker, it's something to be built with a definite deliverable. A lot of organizations focus on automation, but our uh, number one biggie is the collaboration between people. So that's our first topic. Just to get us rolling into this, we'll talk about you know, what is DevOps super quick. This is a waterfall methodology. This is an agile methodology. Lots of businesses, whenever they look to modernize their software development, implement agile. And whenever they start getting their development teams doing stand-up meetings every day, what they end up with is this right here water scrum fall, where we have monolithic business processes on the left. Our development team is going to release software very, very quickly in the middle. And then our QA and operations, te operations teams uh, doing very monolithic, slow processes on the right. And as uh, our developers release code very, very quickly, you find that the QA and operations teams are unable to keep up. Yeah. and. The good thing about Agile is, is Agile really helps the development process because a waterfall, the way it's implemented generally slows down the development process. And a lot of companies see a lot of, you know, better software and increases in, you know, patches and, and whatnot when you're developing things. But the problem is, is Agile mainly just focuses on creating great software, not so much on running great software or getting great user feedback for their software. Right. I think it's uh, embedding the customer and making sure we're building the right thing, but not necessarily operating it in the real world. Big ten of uh, DevOps is breaking down business silos. As you see here, here's our uh, picture of the silos. These silos block collaboration, mainly because people within a silo, day to day, they only work within a silo and they report to leaders that were within those silos. And uh, naturally speaking, these different groups can have competing incentives and have competing different goals. Yeah, and a lot of times, some of these teams might not even talk to each other. Other times, the teams hate each other. Um, you have security folks doing, you know, checking on the application saying, this is insecure, you can't have this in your app. And then it's just not a happy process normally. Yeah, whereas devs, they just want to get their stuff out the door and yes. the QA and operations are raising the red flag and blocking their progress. Exactly. So what DevOps aims to do is get these different silos working together and all on the same page. 
Uh, we just want to say be having your organization organized in business silos where uh, there is no collaboration, these reinforce the waterfall uh, software development methodology. It, it makes sense logically. We have our developers concerned with the requirements, the design, the implementation. Then once they're completely done, hand off their work to the QA. And once that activity is done, look at uh, hand it off to IT operations. We're talking about strictly DevOps, but security is mixed in here as well. Perhaps at the end, in order, especially on DoD programs where the information assurance aspects are only taken care of at the end. Sure, and and at least in, during this process, you hope that somebody's doing the security process because you know a lot of times developers are more focused on the new shiny thing, getting the code out, and not taking you know a security stance since security is kind of paramount that everybody in the process has security in mind. Right, because security is everybody's responsibility. Exactly. So DevOps is an extension of Agile thinking. In Agile, we want to embrace constant change to our software. We want to embed the customer in the process of making the software to make sure we're building the right thing that the customer actually wants. DevOps is an extension of that where in addition to embracing changing the software quickly, you want to embrace delivering the software uh, constantly and embedding operations team uh, so that we get their so we make sure that the software works once it gets deployed. Now the term is DevOps, but we can also see that the same principle can be applied to extending to security to legal. So we could say league DevOps D. DevSecOps, uh, keep roping in the, we want to keep roping in the relevant stakeholders uh, into the acronym, but for the sake of conversation, we just call it DevOps. Yeah, DevOps is normally where most organizations focus because that's normally where the biggest silo, um, you know, right, the they're biggest at the core silo of, bridge. They're is, at the core of things. Yes. But you know, our focus today is how to bring security into the DevOps process. Exactly. So a quick comment just from, from an audience member. Is, is, are you saying, the, is the waterfall process bad for DevOps and security? Um, I'd say... It's what, not necessarily bad, but the, with the waterfall process, is it's kind of, everything's kind of designed to be in a compartment. So when everything's in a compartment, then security is just a compartment kind of stuck on the waterfall, so you know perhaps it's at the beginning of the waterfall if you're doing a, a successful waterfall project, or maybe it's the last you know the last jump where the salmon jump down you know to get it along the river, and then you're just you know the second thought because you know you're just trying to get the thing out the door because your deadlines are up, you're you know you have people saying where's my product, and you're like well it's you know, the security isn't any good, so we have to fix it. Right, or else it's best effort security. So I'd say that, you know, uh, I say at conference talks a lot of times, if uh, McDonald's McRiddles taught us with syrup, is security's best baked in from the beginning. Yes, that is very true. So, you know, just to wrap things up, DevOps aims to increase the pace of innovation, responsiveness to business needs, increase collaboration, and increase software quality. Just to go over some DevOps tenets, uh, DevOps aims to reduce business silos and increase the collaboration and communication amongst teams to make sure that, to increase the likelihood that we're gonna get it right the first time. We wanna use automation as much as possible. We wanna build a little, deploy a little, test a little. We want to have a culture of continually improving our daily work habits to get better and better and uh, in addition to that, make sure that we have our systems, our automation systems linked so that we can fully harness them and take advantage of uh, you know, the data that these automation systems provide so that we have uh, transparency and visibility to all stakeholders on what's going on. Yeah, visibility is important, especially with other teams trying to find out when you're deploying upper management wants to know where the status is, Vis you know, so visibility is key and that's one of the whole parts of the collaboration. Yeah, I remember being a you know being in a shop where the only way we had visibility is to have 
me status meetings where you know people would talk together talk to each other where if we have automate these automation capabilities and dashboards you know that it democratizes the information so that everybody can be on the same page without you know getting together and you know speaking about it v verbally sure and then what what always happens with status meetings is you know you have you know higher managers mid level management and they have other concerns to deal with, so they can't make the status meetings. So they're getting secondhand information from the person who was there, kind of as their liaison. So they may not have a full grasp on, you know, what the goals were and what management was expecting. Yeah, I've been in uh, you know different shops advising on DevOps where I attend all these status meetings and sort of follow the thread and. The middle level managers, I see the same crowd all day long in the meetings I attend, and I think to myself, you know, important decisions are being made, but at what point does this information get, if these people are in meetings all day, at what point does this uh, information get disseminated down to the individual contributors? Yeah, and that is that that is a good concern because unless you're in that particular meeting, that, that when that decision is being made, you're kind of out of the loop, especially if you're, you know, if it's involving a software piece that, you know, has, you know, a lot of functionality built into it and it's an important feature and you're kind of on the last, you know, the last person to know, you're like, well, I could have been working to make this better. Yeah, the old game of telephone. <laughs> yes. All right. Our next way to boost cybersecurity is unified, unified data. data. We were, we've been practicing that a lot all night. <laughs> so up on the screen... We have, this is a representative diagram with a bunch of different types of tools that you might have in your DevOps automation environment. And the, the lines between them, they may vary depending on your environment, but the point here is that we want all these tools to be able to share their data and talk to each other where it makes sense. You know, we talked about how important it is for the human aspect to be integrated and collaborating and communicating. The tools doing the same thing is just as important, if not more, because that's how we can uh, give everybody visibility of what's actually going on. Yeah, tools, like we try to not emphasize tools in DevOps, but they do serve a great purpose as long as you don't just consider having tools, you know, that's how you get your DevOps. You just have a bunch of tools doing, you know, all these things that nobody pays attention to. And to say tools don't get you DevOps, sort of like the same way money doesn't buy you happiness, but it sure helps. It sure can help, yes. <laughs> so just to go through some use cases of questions you might want to ask and how the tool, what tools need to be integrated in order to answer these questions. So if there's a some sort of security incident, we're saying, hmm, what, what changed? Why, why is our security posture different? Might, we want to look at the data from our issue tracker. We want to look at source control and know what, issue, what changes to the source code were linked to what issue. We want to be linked to our documentation system so that we know what changes to the documentation, uh, what's been written by tech writers about the la latest changes. We want to be connected to our build system so we can know when and what was deployed. Also, we might want to look at our integration environment to inspect you know, the actual implementation. This also, this workflow here, you know, it goes for security. It also goes for you know, production support for you know, people that have to deal with outages due to development deployments. Yeah. This the focus of this is on security, but this, you know, secu security is really a QA problem. If you have a security vulnerability, that's the same, sort of the same thing as a QA defect in sure. terms of how we can identify and how we can roll out a fix for that. Um, if we want to know who is involved in a peer review of a change, say a bad change went in and we need to beef up our peer review process, having an integrated code review system lets us have a, you know, a hard record of who was involved in looking at a change before it went in. Yeah, everybody likes the get blame command until you realize it points back to you're the person who did the commit. <laughs> yeah, and I think every single IT shop under the sun has a uh, policy that every change must be peer reviewed. But in organizations that I've been in, uh, 
it's very inconsistent. It can vary from team to team how the peer review process is instituted. Sometimes they follow a checklist and they do their due diligence. Sometimes after a stand-up meeting, it might be uh, you know, looking over somebody's shoulder and saying, oh, that looks good enough. We need to get this out right away. So by integrating a peer review system uh, with the changes, we can better have you know, more tight control and more visibility over who's involved with the peer review process and you know, get a more standardized control over how that happens. Sure, because part of the, the, the review process, you know, sometimes the other thing that can happen is you might have a review process, but you have to push a change out. You know, maybe it's a quick fix, maybe it's a, a security issue. And I say, oh, hey, Aaron, I'm doing X, Y, Z. What do you think? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's okay. But if you don't have, you know, a gatekeeper to say, no, you have to do a full review, review the diffs, check the code. And, you know, that's, it's an important just to have that as a, a step. And additionally, it, pro it provides a lot of documentation because say you go on GitHub and you look at, for example, you go to Django and you look at some of the pull requests or even some of the discussions you see for uh, the Linux kernel, like the, the pull request has, you know, a lot of documentation where there's a lot of good um, back and forth about like what the change is doing, what the change might affect. And it's a good history lesson for a developer who wasn't around for that change. And it's good for the person who was there that can't remember exactly why they put that change in or, you know, the details about it. Yeah, I can see how that, that's uh, crucial for solving the bus problem whenever there's staff turnover by having a something written in, so, written in ones and zeros, so to speak, that you know, can be preserved. That's a great history to learn, you know, why certain things were made and to, you know, pass on knowledge about the system to future generations. Sure, it beats handing uh, the, new, the new person a 400 pound manual. Yeah, that might be out of date or just read, <laughs> typically what I've found is you just have to read the source code to figure out how it works. Exactly. Um, another question, is there anything unusual happening right now in my system? Say we're deployed and I just want to know, is, uh, is there something up with my system? We can look at our monitoring system in addition to our communication system. If those things are integrated together, we're talking about maybe uh, a monitoring system firing alerts to a chat window or sending emails to whoever can should respond to those things. Yeah, exactly. Chat ops, a lot of... Uh a lot of places integrate that um, specifically with monitoring and it makes it easier for somebody to say, hey, I'm jumping on this problem. And also, well, some, pe some folks are putting bots in there now too so they can say, hey, you know, do X, Y, Z and then they can look at the problem when they're like taking a, you know, note out of a load balancer, you know, to fix whatever the issue is. Next question we might want to answer, especially if there's a security incident. Uh, do I have this particular piece of software deployed anywhere? We have visibility of that through our monitoring system, through our source code repository, and through our build CI system so you can see when things are deployed. Sure, not every vulnerability is as easy as looking for shell shocked and you know, a whole fleet of Unix boxes where you just know you have to patch everything. You might just have you know, maybe Open LDAP has a security problem and you only have two Open LDAP servers, but maybe you have, you know, a smattering of an application across, you know, hundreds of nodes. And if you can just do a quick query and get a list of nodes, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, I think it also makes it easier to get a handle on how many different versions of a particular library or piece of software we have so that we can make an attempt to try to standardize within an organization on the number of versions we have in order to make it easier to uh, you know, mitigate incidents like that. Sure, and the, it, that is a, a very valid thing because some libraries you would think that the semantic versioning would be, you know, version one is all compatible, version two is all compatible. But personally, I've had experience where I think it's libpeng or libjpeg, you know, 1.4 to 1.5 is exactly nothing alike in binary compatibility. So, and one OS version has one version or another. So if you're trying to move your code from one side to another uh, version of the OS, you're just like, what's happening here?
<laughs> I know. I thought semantic versioning with the major version stays the same. We're supposed to be all good. good. <laughs> but re reality... It's not always the case. It's not always the case. Our next way to boost cybersecurity is security, security hardening. hardening. So this is all about hardening our platform, platform security, the servers, the networks that our uh, software runs on. Uh, on the screen here, I have an overall diagram of a suggested workflow that you might take. Uh, first, we're gonna go in detail through this, but basically developing a list of security hardening rules that we wish to apply to our, so our commercial off-the-shelf so software or operating systems or open source software. Uh, we want to get a list of security hardening rules. We want to customize them and tweak them so that it fits in our environment. We want to develop the automation to uh, apply those rules as well as unapply those rules in the case where we need to lower, we want to take a hardened box and lower the drawbridge in order to go into a maintenance mode or a fix it mode so that we can allow engineers into a system in order to fix it. Uh, we want to uh, verify that that stuff worked and after we're hardened, we want to continuously monitor the system to assure that nothing has diverged. So it's a great place to start is with STIG hardening guides from DISA. Up on the screen, I have the URL. Um, these STIGs, they're uh, security technical imp implementation guides. They cover uh, various specific software that's mainstream enough for uh, DISA to develop one of these, and also general guidance if your piece of software doesn't uh, fall within one of these hardening guides. It's a great starting point for rules, and I'll show you what an example rule is. Uh, here's one for uh, RHEL Linux 6, I think is where I got this. And it's just saying that the Etsy password file must be owned by root, meaning that it can only be mo uh, modified by the system administrator. And we see here that the fix text, it gives the, uni uh, the Unix command line to implement this rule. I think what's important here is uh, that depending on your flavor of operating system, the fixed text might need to be tweaked or you might be able to go above and beyond what the STIG is uh, suggesting here. Yeah, uh, you know, with, with most Linux variants, you know, your, your group and your root user are root and root, but if you go to the BSDs, like FreeBSD, uh, root and the group for the root operating is wheel, so. Yeah, so the implementation is slightly different. different. So, and a quick quick comment, just asking who yeah. who's performing this platform hardening task? Is it the dev team or ops or security team? Well, I think I think that varies, uh, you know, from org to org. I think what's really important is that those three groups are all involved. Um, if you have expertise in implementing them on your dev team, I think it would make sense for them to actually do the work, but to also have operations and security maybe perhaps peer reviewing that work and being very intimately involved in how this process is orchestrated. So depending on the skill sets of within the organization, you know, I think, you know, who does what can vary a little bit, but the important thing is that the it's all three of those groups' responsibility, and it's somewhat blended. Yeah, the security with the security folks, they might be more apt to understand exactly what the the focus is of the stig hardening rule. Um, and I've been in some organizations where the developers they're pushing down the infrastructure as code to do the changes, and I've also known other organizations that their ops team is working on those changes, and they're doing a lot of the, more of the monitoring to verify that they're staying in place. So it just varies on, like you said, skill set and who has the availability to do that and, and who's called out and saying that, hey, I'm going to do that. Yeah, but, it just to re but at, the, at the end of the day, it's a blended responsibility and all three of those groups should be a uh, stakeholder in that. Exactly. They, it should be something that everybody is saying, hey, this particular thing, I saw this, this is going to make security a little bit better. Right. So there's a, you know, one task of coming up with the rules and customizing them like we have on the screen right now. 
where we want to maybe add new rules that we dream up ourselves or tweak them on how uh, they're implemented, or maybe remove ones that aren't applicable to our system at all. Yeah, for example, like looking through the rules for uh, Red Hat 6, you know, there's a rule for make sure you don't have TFTP installed, or if you do, make sure it's set so it's only in one directory. Now, if you have an organization that doesn't pixie boot any um, network devices, then you wouldn't have TFTP installed. So it's just kind of common sense to say, you know, hey, if you do do this, then you should probably implement this change, but not everybody is going to be able to do that or need to do that. Yeah, I think what you just mentioned sort of outlines how important it is for security dev and ops to be working in concert because if we have a security team who isn't very familiar with how the system is implemented and they decree from on high that uh, TFTP should be disabled, uh, you know, the only way we might and we're in a waterfall model, you know, we might break, break things right before things go into production. Sure. Unless these things are tested early when the collaboration is happening across those groups. Or maybe it is a general rule and then now you have system administrators, now they're forced to go around and manually like wiring CDs into virtual machines to boot them up and get them configured. So in any case, you could have, you know, unintended consequences. Yes. So just to move on and talking about our platform hardening workflow, we want to identify exceptions. This step sort of um, picking and choosing which hosts in our system deserve which rules where, you know, our TFTP server, for example, might need, you know, that service enabled or a web server might need port 80 open where other app servers might need that closed. So this exceptions process is where we design which rules get applied to which host in the system. And if there's, you know, a rule that should not be applied, that should be understood and documented. Exactly. You don't want to shut off all the ports in your web server because it's going to be difficult to serve content. But it would sure be secure. Though. Sure, yeah. Um, next step, we're saying persist, our, persist everything in some sort of data store. It says security database. There's COTS and FOSS tools that do this. A lot of orgs that I've worked in use uh, spreadsheets to manage this. I'm suggesting a secure, some sort of relational database or something a little more beefy than a spreadsheet just because it becomes cumbersome and reporting out of spreadsheets you know, becomes a manual piece of work. The, the important thing about having your database is you can get really, really caught up in how you're laying these out in a, in a you know, a COTS or, you know, off the, you know, flush tool. But the important thing is you don't take this process and turn it into this big giant organization where you have to hire 20 people to maintain everything because you can really get carried away about dependencies on this and this and, you know, it just, you need to, you need to keep what you have you know, so it's usable but not unmaintainable. For sure. Next step in our uh, workflow is automated implementation. And this is the infrastructure as code and the where the DevOpsy, you know, tooling comes in. Um, some just ground rules. We want to store this in source control along with our application code for our system that we're hardening. We want to practice the orchestration of applying these hardening rules early and often because some of these hardening rules, they do some pretty hardcore things to a system. And, you know, we, I know engineering can do its best effort in designing which rules can be turned on, but we want to make sure that we're testing this uh, often because these rules can break something. And we also want to uh, keep in mind whenever we're implementing that we might need to apply rules and undo rules for different modes of the system. For example, if we need to upgrade our system, we might need uh, interactive login to be applied. Exactly. And, and in, like uh, if you're using YUM or Aptitude to do system upgrades, sometimes those tools are expecting a specific permission or a file in a certain location. So they could break your update. The other possibility is, you know, some uh, Unix systems allow you to set uh, file immutability, so even root can't change a file. So if you go to apply all these root rules and you have a lot of, fi a lot of files set to immutable, then your, all your 
updates are going to fail and you can't change anything. Which is a bad, bad way to be. Yes. And just there in the lower right-hand corner, there's just a little snippet of some chef code, which is a common, very popular infrastructure as code uh, tool on how we would implement the stig rule that we show where we're setting the Etsy password file to be owned by root. Um, next step in our workflow is scanning for vulnerabilities. This is sort of our check, and there's many uh, required tools. A lot of organizations are required to use the scan their boxes to assure that there's no known vul vulnerabilities. And uh, you know, the, the DevOpsy note here is that we want to persist these results, the output from these tools, so that we can look at how they change over time and how they evolve. Yeah, it's like a lot of these tools, the first thing that comes to my mind is like directory, web server directory trans, uh, transversal where you try to go outside of the web server route. And that's like a common thing that, you know, you want to make sure that you can't, you know, do that and download, you know. You have a bad day if you can <laughs> yeah, do that. <laughs> download the, the, the shadow file or, or the password file. Next uh, step in the workflow is to have a, some sort of system for continuous monitoring of the system from a security perspective. This is something like a tripwire to, so we take a snapshot of a subset of our system, mainly the file system or maybe processes running. If there's any deviation from that behavior, then we, we have, we're able to trigger an alert so that we're aware that something unexpected might have happened. And for this process, my uh, sage advice on implementing one of these is to start small. I've been in organizations where they send a team of 20 developers off to the races, uh, creating automation to apply hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules, only to find that the way that they were implemented didn't work quite right in their environment. So this led to tons of rework. So my advice is to start off with just a few rules and run them the whole way through this life cycle to, uh, um, to get learnings and the shift left learnings that you might have on maybe, um, you know, you might find that you, the way we have these implemented, we're not able to unharden them, things like that. Yeah, sometimes when you're doing this, like, it's kind of like doing a uh, drywall. It's like when you're, when you're doing this, less is actually more until you figure <laughs> out what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Just so we don't waste time. Um, very important to harden as much as possible our development and test environments so that we don't have any surprises in our ops-like environments before we go to production. And again, practicing the maintenance activities because the unhardening can be quite tricky. Yes. So, uh, Shane, is there any questions? We do have a couple of questions, I think, relative to this section. Um, Rick was asking, what recommendations would you offer uh, as a skill set for security folks to work with the DevOps team? Well, I, th I think that security folks having a good uh, overall grasp of security folks, like I know some of the, the folks I've worked with before, get, you know, they know a lot of really good security principles, and you know, maybe it's something you sit down and you review stig rules because you know if you're you know if you're in the uh the government sector you're probably going to have to Im implement some sort of stig rule um if you're in the commercial sector you know maybe you're not required to do that but maybe it's just a, a good practice to look through and see you know a lot of security folks go and they collaborate you know with different companies and they get together and they talk about what's their primary issue so sometimes it's just a lot of collaboration, understanding the, the attack vector you have today. Yeah. Um, I guess my comment on that is, uh, you know, the more, the more general people are, the better. Um, if you have security folks with a little bit of system knowledge of the system that they're securing, the more we have that, the better. The, if they're able to configure their home network, their home router, sure, yeah. the better to have like some hands-on knowledge of these things. That will just increase their ability to, uh, you know, collaborate with how these rules are implemented and be able to contribute in that way. Yeah, going on that, I, I uh, formerly worked with uh, sysadmin turned to security, and it really made things great because you could talk, you know, system internals and you could talk security. And it was a lot easier to put two and two together. 
Right. And even if you don't have those uh, skill sets, getting those uh, people's work closely aligned and in the same room so that they can cross cross mojinate and share those skill sure. sets. The more we can maximize that, the better, of course. All right. Well, moving right along to our next way to boost cybersecurity with DevOps is AppSec. <laughs> Here on the screen, we have the SEI Secure DevOps Lifecycle. And just pointing out the different uh, places in the SDLC uh, where we can uh, use apply automation and modernization to increase security. Uh, at project inception, very important to uh, focus on threat modeling. During our project configuration stand up, uh, secure hard environments like what I, we mentioned in the last section. Uh, whenever we're going through coding, having a security focused code review process, perhaps with some automation sprinkled in there so that whenever a developer wants to change the developer's definition of done to make sure that there's an automated system in place to make sure that there's a some sort of code review, um, preferably a security focused code review for the change, you know, uh, warrants that and may perhaps systems in place to make sure that they're going through a checklist and the you know the results of that review are persisted. Sure and along those lines is that this is also great where you're running both your unit and functional tests to ensure that you know the the actual uh, story you're working on is is completed through the functional test and you know it provides a functionality that you're intending and that that goes along with security and you know it's good it's all a great place to scan and check to make sure that you're not you know in a in a state where you don't want to be yes indeed yeah and what you're mentioning you know leads us into continuous integration testing functional testing uh, perhaps building our software at running unit tests running static code analysis and deploying the the software to an ops like environment and running uh, automated security testing on the system stood up uh, I think it's very important to note that we have all this automation. If we have security testing in our pipeline, uh, do we still need human intervention? Absolutely, sure. we do. Uh, and it's very common for there to be a stop sign in our automated build environment software factory um, where you know somebody has to go in and take a look-see-loo. I think what's important here is to recognize that pausing for manual steps is typical. And uh, what our goal is to optimize this manual work. So uh, before we release our software, if we have to do an application, an AppSec security evaluation by security team, perhaps automate the process of getting those folks the, all the information they need in front of them, like uh, credentials, server locations. Server logs, server logging automate the part so we can provide them a package of data that they need to do their manual step. Um, perhaps they run tools on it. We want to persist the output of any tools that they run so that we have a history there and uh, you know, maximize the speed that these manual processes can take place. It, this is natural in the development process. The goal is to catch it before it goes into production. And so this might seem like a big uh, a, a blocker, but you know, in the grand scheme of everything, it, it's actually going to benefit everybody in the long run. Absolutely. Next, we're going to talk about some dependency management. Sure. So nowadays, you know, when you build software, you're not just you know writing all these lines of code to do everything in your piece of software you need. For example, you know, you're, most people aren't writing their own object relational mapper. So most software nowadays is you're getting, you know, probably like 70 to 80 percent open source software, and you're writing glue code, you're writing your front end, you're writing your business logic. So, you know, you don't want developers just to be pip installing any package they come into contact with or downloading every JavaScript framework that you can act, download on the internet and putting it into your application because there's like 400 million JavaScript frameworks, so that's just bad. 
So the idea of dependency management is is it gives you you need to have some sort of sheriff to to say, hey, let's let's verify that these dependencies are something that we want or something that's not you know bad or have security issues. So part of doing doing the management is we have infosec involved in the process. We have developers, and then we have a dependency repository. So the goal with the, the repository is you take, the developer says, hey, I, I want to use uh, SQL Alchemy in my project because it's going to make a great object relational mapper. So InfoSec will take a look at it. Maybe they have tools to scan Python code. Maybe they you know, have different ways that they're vetting their software. And if they say, yes, you know, we can use this package, then they can put it into a, a dependency repository that will, uh, that will be able to, to be accessible by your build server and your CI server. So when you're building a release, it'll pull down that dependency from your repository and not allow the build server to pull it from an outside location. And then once it's in that repository, you keep it there for as long as possibly it's needed. That way that you always have this available. And these, you know, dependency repository is kind of a generic term. Like, there's different ways you can do that. Yeah, it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, a file, some directory full of files, or it could be something like there's, uh, you know, different open source tools that provide this that where you can have your own internal PyPy repository, sure. uh, your own Maven Central in order so that all the uh, build tools can sort of talk seamlessly. All you have to do is point them at your internal repository full of uh, quote unquote blessed artifacts that have been screened by security. Yeah, it, some of them, it's, it all depends on what, what these purposes are serving. You can go as fancy as having a full you know, repository that has all you know, uh, a nice interface and automated, or you can just have you know, it's easy enough to set up, uh, you know, Apache or Nginx server and point it at a direct with Python files to serve as your uh, PyPI repository. Yeah, the important thing is to avoid having developers your build server reach out to the internet and uh, download tons of dependencies during your build process because you never know what you're going to get. Sure. So part of part of what why we're saying we don't you don't know what you're going to get is you have different things that can happen. First, you have always have the security issue. You have, you know, what I like to call the angry author issue where you have somebody who's trying to do, who's just mad about something. Then you always have, you know, packages that you want to hold for eternity. And then, you know, people don't think about this. You always have uptime connectivity. If you're trying to force out a build and your internet's down, you know, that's going to limit your connectivity to down a package so if it's internal right yeah you know, that's going to save you time and probably money right so yeah lots of benefits here i think we're going to go into detail in some of these because they're very interesting stories that we wanted to share with the audience on you know different things that can happen if you don't manage your dependencies and assure supply chain hygiene sure so security is always you know a, a good topic to focus on when you're when you're looking at dependencies you know, just as a simple example, like everybody's run into typo squatting where you go to a domain name and you spell it wrong and it goes to some, you know. I never, I'm not such a good typer. That's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> you end up at a link farm or some random place. But this can happen with your dependencies. Um, they found this out on PyPI. They, people had uploaded libraries with slightly different names. And like, for example, like I can never spell SQL Alchemy unless I like look it up. So somebody had flipped some of the words around, you so know, like switch two letters around. Yeah, exactly. You would download the bad package, and they some of these packages were phoning information home to, you know, foreign actors, and you know that probably is not a good thing. I would say. No, very very bad. So <laughs> just an example of why it's very important to have security screen all these little bits that you know comprise our software to make sure that we're dealing with. Not relying on you know a developer not doing a may having a typo. Sure. 
And the other thing with security is, you know, we get packages now with Windows and probably Mac and most of the operating system that you're, you're cryptographically signed. So that should be make sure that all the packages are perfectly fine, right? So that so just to clarify for the audience, that means crypto, they're signed so that if something's signed by Microsoft, I know that that binary that I'm downloading came from Microsoft and I can trust it. So normally the signing process, you have a public key that everybody recognizes and you have a private key that you tuck in a safe and you only take it out and use it when you're making a signature on an application. Well, in the case of D-Link and Yahoo, somehow their key got out on the internet. So that means that I could pick up a package and say, hey, I'm Yahoo, or you know, Eric could say, this firmware is from D-Link, and nobody would have any better idea because it's all built in and signed and said, hey, you know, there's a, cer a certificate authority that says, yeah, this is D-Link for sure. And then Linux Mint was kind of like a, they were victims of somebody that hacked into their server and put a, and replaced their ISO with a malicious one and then changed the signature that you could compare. So people were downloading this for a short period of time and installing it and guess what it did? It was phoning home information to somebody. And the victims were none the wiser. So this is uh, another thing is what I like to call the angry author as I was saying before. So there's a gentleman who had an NPM package that was published and... Very widely used, by the way. Sure. And some of his other packages happened to coincide with a trademark. And he was asked to give up one of his packages to release it to the trademark owner, which it's not like, a, you know, it's kind of one of those, you know, hey, this is a nice thing to do. We don't want to sue you. But then he just got... They got, he didn't want to do it, so NPM said, we're pulling your package. And then he says, you know what, I'm pulling all my packages off NPM. Of One of his packages happened to be the left pad package, which basically all those 4 million JavaScript frameworks happen to use. So everybody's build system broke until they figured out different, they tried different ways to fix it. And they didn't work because the versioning was wrong. So finally they had to republish the package to fix it until they can, you know, everybody could update their code. So this is another reason why to have your dependencies in-house because those aren't always going to be on the system. Somebody can make them disappear. And so you don't want to be just, you yeah. know, victim of an internet flame war. Yeah, it assures the repeatability of our build process because we're on all the dependencies to b build our software at one point in time are under our control and under our influence so that we things like this don't happen. shouldn't happen. <laughs> Same thing with maintenance, like years down the road, hopefully you don't work on a project that never ends. You know, eventually there's hope, there's hopefully some end in sight. Eventually that project's going to be running on some lonely server in a dusty closet and then somebody's going to do a security scan and say, hey, we need to update some part of this application because it's insecure. So you pull out the source code from a dusty closet and you realize that you don't have a particular package because it's now version you know, 27, you start off with version 2.0. So you try to integrate a new package and it doesn't work because all the APIs change. And part of this dependency management is to ensure you have uh, a consistent history of, of packages. That way you, know, you can build a package and make sure at any time in its history that it's, it's ready to go and can be deployed out the door. Yeah, I've, I've seen instances where if we're forced to upgrade a single dependency, that dependency depends on other things that need to be upgraded. So it's sort of a domino effect and we end up uh, biting off a lot more than we can chew and being forced into a DLL hell situation where uh, by not having an older dependency yeah. and upgrading, we end up having to upgrade a whole lot more than we have the time or budget for. Yeah, and it, it could be as much as just dependencies or you might have to rebuild your all your dependency stack if you're custom com compiling open source tools. So it just, you know, it's a good idea to just keep those things in your back pocket so you have them. 
Shane, do we have any uh, new questions from the audience? One, one that came in earlier, and we may be able to save it for the end if it's not the perfect time. I'll just read it off. It was asking, how can we establish a platform for collaboration amongst all stakeholders, including security? Like I said, we, it was from earlier in the talk, so we may be able to review it at the end. But if, if there's a quick answer, we can take it now. I'll leave you handle that one. Yeah, yeah establish a platform for collaboration. I think, yeah. um, well, I think uh, establish source control, have all the tools available so that everybody's working off of a common workbench, um, have a method of communica communication between these teams, uh, wiki pages, uh, you know, document repositories, all the tools that we listed earlier, you know, ideally would be if an environment, if a organization has all of those tools, you know, I think that's the perfect platform for collaboration between security and development. Uh, and, and a quick one in regards to the security aspects built into the, the life cycle. What does that do to cost? Obviously, there, there's costs involved there. Is this preventative stuff that you're going to pay for later? You're, pre you're, you're preventing, you know, different outbreaks, but what, what's the cost up front? Is it uh, there's that with all yeah. DevOps things, and I think that's one of the big yeah. barriers of adopting DevOps is because, you know, DevOps sort of forces us to tackle challenges much earlier than traditionally. And in the DoD projects that we follow, in programs that are trying to ad adopt DevOps midstream, that's one of the struggles. Um, for developers in a lot of DoD programs that are set up to be waterfall, development gets credit for doing their work on a best effort uh, basis, meaning as soon as the developer is done with their code and it works on their machine, they can take credit for that work and they're done. And then months down the road, will it go through formal testing perhaps and security things? So what DevOps forces us to do and what we're talking about is shifting all those things left so that they're happening much earlier. So there may be a uh, greater cost because we're doing more things earlier, but for the benefit of the long term, all these DevOps things, it's a very long term focus. And it's one of the, it's a very common challenge to try to quantify right. the ROI early on because we're just doing so many more things early. Yeah, and it's especially, it's like if you take over an old project that didn't have any testing, automated testing at all, you know, you can't just go and write you know, five million unit tests for code that has, you know, a million lines. It's just not feasible. But you can start out small, but like if you're making a change, try to put tests on your new changes. Try to test things that are around your change and affecting. And that's kind of the way with DevOps is, you know, you don't, you can't always go, you know, full tilt into doing DevOps and doing security scans. But the good thing about it is, is after you do an investment, it's like money in the bank. Like you don't have to, once you make a security scan to scan your application or test it, you don't have to do that anymore. It's just, it's free every time you run it. The only thing you're paying for is CPU cycles. So you're not going to spend a ton of up, you know, time after you spent your upfront time. Yeah. Uh, just to like build on what you're saying, Doug. Uh, one of the big challenges to for organizations to adopt convert from a old school waterfall mindset is the inertia of the organization where this is the way we've always done things and this is uh, our traditional roles that individual contributors have and the jobs that they have. Um, there's tremendous inertia and it could be uh, it's something that's sort of unquantifiable but it's definitely there. But on the good side, um, with DevOps, if we start out small, we can gather inertia in the form of skill sets and for individual contributors seeing that their jobs are being done better and that they uh, become easier after they automate some of the arduous, uh, tedious work. And uh, I've found that that inertia takes over and things start to speed up and get easier as we have you know, these core capabilities established it, on performing security scans. So if you can automate one pen test, very, it can be very difficult to get that one out the door. But as each uh, security test is added on to our pipeline, it just becomes 
faster, easier, and cheaper to implement. You get economies of scale. Yeah, it's very similar when you're setting up CI. You know, everybody can build. You know, go into you know your your development environment and build a software on your laptop. But to have a build server, it takes a little bit of time to have it set up and working quite the way you want it to. But after you have it, you know, it's just it's there. You expect it to be there. If you have to make a tweak to it. You're not redoing the whole entire environment. You're just changing, you know, build parameters or, you know, how the builds flow into the system. Making small incremental changes. And uh, if that build server goes away and it's down for some reason, then people miss it very, very, oh, very yes. badly. <laughs> All right. Well, we're uh, heading in the uh, home stretch here. Our last way to boost cybersecurity with DevOps is through monitoring. monitoring. So, so part of the eye of Sauron. Yes, or the uh, eye on top of the pyramid on the dollar bill. So you kind of, <laughs> you know, the idea with monitoring is you want to keep, you know, you don't, you can't always see everything, but it's the idea is everything's visual and everything is available for you to to peruse when you're. You know, trying to inspect the system or understand what's happening in the system. And there's different things you can monitor. There's different quantities you can monitor. You can monitor, you know, just like we were sp speaking with security, you, you probably want to start out with monitoring small because you can go really, uh, you can go really uh, put a lot of time into monitoring. You can monitor like every aspect of your application. But, you know, it's like kind of like a gradual, you know, you, you know, a little bit, you know, less is more when you start out. So with monitoring, there's a lot of different things you can monitor. Like I like to start out and say that monitoring your disk space or memory and swap is probably one of the basic, yeah, that's, most, that's most number important. One. And amazingly, I've seen uh, different government programs that uh, burn millions and millions of dollars where they don't even have a... Uh, simple shell script in a cron job that does a df minus h and email somebody the results if they would have had that they could have avoided a lot of downtime because they're caught uh not monitoring their disk space yeah and and the monitoring point is you know you want to have one place you can look at the monitor and kind of like your collaboration you want to have one place you know that'll like wire into your collaboration system you want to be able to, to know that when you're looking at a screen that you're going in one particular location it has all your monitoring metrics. And we were seeing the whole picture in one place that we can make appropriate business decisions. Exactly. To react. And there's different ways, there's different tools that are open source, like Nagios, probably everybody's heard of that. And Singa, it's like a Nagios fork, open NMS. Then there's Etsy has created an open source StatsD, Graphite. Then you have your elk stack, and just having the, these tools together, you get easy metrics. You don't have to scramble to figure out what you're looking for, what you have to grab. You you can tune your metrics to avoid monitoring fatigue, and it just makes life a, a lot easier when you're trying to. When, this is especially more important with operations, but development needs to know this as well because if they're trying to react to a security issue or a problem, you know, you need to know what you're looking for and you need to know metrics on how this happened, what the quantity was and things like that. Yeah, just to hit back on your uh, monitoring fatigue is where we have, we're overwhelmed with whoever's wa whoever the watcher is, they're overwhelmed with so many false positives. They open up their email and they just see hundreds of emails and they don't know which alerts are real alert, real or not. So that's mo what monitoring fatigue is, is where, uh, you know, we're not seeing the signal through the noise. Yeah, and, uh, you know, a lot, especially with, like, disk monitoring, if you're monitoring um, backup space on a database server, you you could be using space and all of a sudden, you know, you're at 90% and all of a sudden you drop to 50%. Because your archive logs are rolled back into the primary backup, depending on how your database is. So you're like, oh, I don't need any space anymore. Then it just happens again. And then you can see this trend and say, oh, I really need to add more disk space to my database. Yeah, I think that's a very important part with monitoring is to under, uh, whenever we institute monitoring, 
Uh, and this applies not only to monitoring our systems, but also monitoring our development. Uh, we have very few, very rarely do we have any idea of what good looks like whenever we're looking at this data. And it's very helpful to look for trends in the data and see if we're uh, going from 50% to you know 75% overnight. We know that that's probably a problem where something's filling up a log or something to that uh, respect. But yeah, and I just wanted to you know, also applies to if we're monitoring our DevOps environment, uh, how many builds per day, mean time to MTTR, mean time to recovery of a pipeline, uh, number of unit tests, number of failed tests. Out the gate, most of the orgs don't have any idea of what they should be looking for there. And it's a learning process on, you know, what numbers uh, they should be looking at, what thresholds make sense, because you know, just blindly looking at uh, you know MTTR and demanding that that's one hour, that's not necessarily a good thing. No, not at all. So part of this storage space is you have a lot of different you know occasions where logs are, and logging and running out of logs and storage could be just you need more space, or you could have you know, somebody performing a DDoS attack. You could have coding errors that are like filling up your disks. Um, you know, malware, you could have exploits, buffer overruns, underruns, just a ton of things that could cause this that are, some are security related and some aren't necessarily security related. Yeah, hopefully more often than not, they're not security related, yes. but we cannot ignore that this is a you know, very strong signal that uh, there might be a uh, security incident occurring. And the other thing that can be a good monitoring aspect is your, if you have a web application, you have, you know, you monitor your web requests. You know, a lot of times, you know, if you get a lot of 401s, you know, not everybody remembers their password on the same, the same try, but you, know, you might have a couple of those a day. But if you all of a sudden have, you know, 50,000 failed requests, you know, that could be in the, you know, an indication that you have you know, issues with somebody doing a dictionary attack. Yeah, I think that's why it's so important to have unified data so that we're, we have visibility of what changed in the system. If we're seeing a spike in these invalid requests, is it a bug or is it a indication of something happening externally? Exactly, and the other thing is important is like error 500s is the same thing with security is that could be a bug that could turn into a security issue, so. Absolutely. So we are at noon right now. So a couple of people may have to drop off. Like, can, can we wrap up with some parting shots or s some conclusions from you guys before before we have to sign off for? for sure. Today? I think we're probably we're good. Okay. Wanna... Yeah. Um, you know, the main takeaways from this are um, the number one focus is collaboration and communication. The uh, tooling is the sexy thing, and the uh, automation and set and uh, tooling is you know the thing that people can grasp onto. But at the core of DevOps and security is to increase people talking and working together with aligned goals. Um, start small. Start with thin horizontal slices to try out uh, things the whole way through the life cycle in order to shift left learnings and. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to bite off an entire. You don't want to automate all the things. Just like if you get a project, you don't want to sit down and write five million unit tests because you know you can do that, but you know it's probably you're not going to see any benefit out of it. Limited value add. Exactly. So you know the idea is if you know if you're starting out a project fresh, it's really a good time to implement DevOps because you can do each step of the way. You know if you're trying to integrate it. You need to take the snowball effect. You need to start small and then gradually increase and get more involved, everybody more involved with the project. Yeah, also very important to apply the scientific method and run experiments, make changes, and define a way to measure the outcomes of changes and determine whether or not something new that we're doing, whether determine, have some sort of measuring stick to determine if the new things that we're doing are working or not because uh, there is no secret sauce to DevOps and it varies so much depending on the uh, context that experimentation is paramount.
Yeah, and it could be a difference between organizations. It could be a difference between applications. It could be a difference between even people. Some people, you know, learn in different ways. Some people, you know, have different preferences. So it's just a matter of finding out what works in your environment. Doug and Aaron, thank you very much. Excellent talk. We, we appreciate your time today. Thanks, Shane. Uh, Thanks. And just to close out, just a reminder for everybody to please complete the survey upon exiting today's presentation. And the link to that survey is at the top of the chat tab uh, within your platform. And just one final plug, uh, for those of you in the DC area, the SEI is hosting a symposium next week with the theme of uh, Agile and DevOps. So if you found some value in today, I know Aaron is, is speaking at that next week. So yeah, we'll we will send out a link there. And the, the best part of that symposium it is free to attend. So we'll send out some more information. Hopefully you can attend that as well. And finally, our next webcast will be May 9th. Our topic will be blockchain, your questions, our answers. Thanks everyone, have a great day.